February 16th, 2015, a day I will never forget. I was on my way to the lost city for the very first time in my life. I'd been waiting 21 years for this moment and couldn't believe it was actually happening. As I would look out the window at the jungle-covered mountains, I somehow had this thought that there's absolutely no place to land in case of an emergency. We're screwed. <laughs> so I looked behind me at a military helicopter following us with other members of our crew, and I noticed it was kind of rocking side to side, pitching back and forth, and I went, this doesn't seem right. So I asked my pilot, is this normal? And he said, absolutely not. <laughs> we looked back, and before we knew it, the other helicopter was gone, was nowhere to be seen. As we turned around, we heard a garbled message on the radio. It was from the Honduran military commander telling us that the computerized stabilizers in their helicopter were failing, and the pilot needed to immediately turn back and try and make it back to the airfield. Fortunately, they did, and all were safe. We would now have to alter our plans as we waited for a replacement aircraft. Such is a typical challenge and a typical day in the life of an explorer. It all began in 1994 when I was working as a cameraman and uh, partner in a production services company in Burbank, California. I had grown tired of being a contractor to the entertainment industry and decided it would be a good idea to start creating some of my own programming. So I began to look for ideas, particularly ones that catered to my native interest in science and adventure. By chance, a director friend of mine introduced me to a uh, real live treasure hunter and explorer type. His name was Steve Morgan, although he preferred to be called Captain Morgan because he had an affinity to the character in the rum ads. Steve had written a number of very short stories about adventures he had done and wanted to do and thought they would be great for a TV show. One of those stories was about a legendary lost city in the Mesquitia jungle of eastern Honduras. The place had two names, Ciudad Blanca, which means white city in Spanish because allegedly the buildings were made out of white stone, and Lost City of the Monkey God, because supposedly the people who lived there worshipped the monkey god. Explorers had been looking for this place ever since the conquistador Hernán Cortés first wrote about it in 1526. The Smithsonian even sent three expeditions in the 1930s. Some explorers would return with fantastical stories and enigmatic artifacts, while others, unfortunately, never returned mainly because the Mesquitia was one of the least explored and roughest jungles in the world. It still is, actually. With unbroken 50-meter canopy, steep mountains, fast rivers, swamps, incredibly thick vegetation, and some of the deadliest wildlife in the Americas. If you look at this old map from 1858, you'll notice that in red it's highlighted Portal del Inferno. It was once known as the Gates of Hell. <laughs> as Morgan was telling me the rest of the story, I knew immediately that this would be a great pilot for a TV series I was going to call Tales of Adventure. I didn't know, however, at the time that my eventual quest for the lost city would lead me down a path that would create a legacy and help change the attitudes of a country. Morgan told me that he could arrange all the, uh, everything that had to be arranged in Honduras, and all I had to do was just raise the money, of course, and take care of the TV production. I really had no idea what, what to do in a jungle or how to make things happen in Honduras. I even thought maybe I could find a book called Finding a Lost City for Dummies, but there wasn't <laughs> such a thing. So I did the next best thing, which was take a deep breath, hold it, cross my fingers, and hope the heck that Morgan knew what he was doing, because I didn't. However, in all fairness, I did study archaeology and the earth sciences while well in college. So I suppose I had some ideas or delusions of what such an adventure would be like, especially when I moved to Los Angeles in 1979 to work with my father in a business selling hot dogs out of a giant wienermobile at Venice Beach. <laughs> Back then, I was only looking for the lost bag of french fries. <laughs> Fortunately, Morgan had a good friend and fellow adventurer named Bruce Heineke. Bruce was going to become our fixer in Honduras <laughs> and take care of all the government permits and local logistics. He had lived in Honduras for a number of years, married to a Honduran woman, and really knew his way around, if you know what I mean. He looked like a character right out of a central casting for a B-movie, <laughs> with his large frame, gruff demeanor, 
gold chain, pinky ring, and a don't screw with me attitude. <laughs> I was really happy that he was on my payroll and only hoped that it would stay that way. <laughs> Before long, we were in Honduras, traveling in dugout canoes over crocodile-infested waters on a dark and moonless night. <laughs> Suddenly, there was this big bang and screams. Two of the canoes collided, and they almost tipped completely over. And I thought, my God, what are we doing here? We're all going to die. We're never going to get home. Well, obviously, we survived because I'm standing here. <laughs> Several days later, after slogging through the rainforest, came upon this very interesting boulder next to a river. Carved into the stone was this amazing image of a man with a strange hat or headdress on or mask, a digging stick, and what appeared to be a gourd with seeds falling out of it. At least that's what the expedition archaeologist told us. I immediately had an epiphany. I thought, here we are, in the middle of the rainforest, high up in the mountains, far away from any human dwellings, What's a carving of a man planting seeds doing in a place like this? I mean, no way you could imagine this is farmland. It's just all jungle. You could barely see 20 feet. I did know, however, that environments can and do change over time. So perhaps it was once a more open landscape in the past, either naturally or modified by the people who once lived there. From that moment on, I became obsessed with trying to find Cida Blanca, or at least proving whether or not it really existed. The 1994 expedition was followed by several others in the next few years, each one leading a bit more to solving the puzzle, but never coming to a definitive conclusion. I started to become rather discouraged, especially when my family was tired of hearing the stories, and my wife would beg me, don't you ever mention the words Honduras and Lost City in this house again or I'm leaving. <laughs> so being a prudent person, I thought it was a good idea to move on with my life which I did. However, I could not keep Ciudad Blanca or the Lost City out of the back of my mind. In 2010, I was reading an article in Archaeology magazine about a new technology called airborne LIDAR. It was being used experimentally at a Maya site in Belize. The idea was to see if airborne LIDAR could be used to uncover unknown archaeological sites in the surrounding jungle. To everyone's amazement, it worked much better than expected. No longer would you have to slowly trudge through the jungle hoping that you're going to stumble on some ruin. Those days were over. Now you could scan large areas quickly and efficiently from the relative comfort of an airplane. This was a game-changing technology, particularly for archaeological survey. See, LIDAR works a bit like radar and sonar, except it uses laser beams instead to create 3D images of whatever it can scan. And best of all, for my purposes, it would allow me to digitally erase the vegetation and expose the ruins underneath. This was amazing. I thought, if I ever have the chance to go looking for Ciudad Blanca again, this is what I'm going to do. Forget the blind leading the blind through the jungle. My attitude was, goodbye, Indiana Jones, and hello, Captain Kirk. I'm going with you in this <laughs> high-tech stuff from now on. <laughs> Coincidentally, just a few days after that, and this is very strange, I get a call from Morgan's friend Bruce, the guy who was our fixer. I hadn't heard from him in 10 years. Not sure I really wanted to, but <laughs> I did. He said he had an in with the new Honduran president, and they wanted to know if I was interested in looking for Ciudad Blanca again and making a film about it. My initial reaction was, are you kidding? If I could get my hands on this airborne LIDAR and combine it with the president's offer to support the mission, I had a winning combination. I mean, when else in my life would I ever have a president of a country invite me to pursue one of my dreams? After that, with the help of a few friends and a filmmaker named Bill Benenson, we spent the next two years organizing the LIDAR mission with making plans to make a film about it. It all seemed so easy until it wasn't. Every day brought challenges. Honduras was really a dangerous place at the time. It had the highest murder rate per capita in the world. Drugs, gangs, and corruption ruled the day. We had to take extreme precautions. In fact, we had to have heavily armed soldiers guard our LIDAR plane 24-7. Plus, we had to fly at least 100 miles a day out of our way just to refuel the aircraft at a secure military facility. No matter how well we were prepared, something always went wrong. One of the worst times was when the LIDAR machine broke in the middle of the mission, and we found out the only replacement part in the world, and it was going to take days to get to us, if at all. Plus, 
We're spending $20,000 a day while we're just sitting around waiting. I lost the few remaining hairs I had in my head on that one. <laughs> Eventually, though, we were able to map a large portion of the mosquito that was essentially unknown. And it included, happened to include, not one, but two lost cities, precisely in the areas that I had targeted for my research over the years. As you can see from this picture, I was quite happy. <laughs> I felt quite vindicated. I was almost doing cartwheels. And here are three images that show you what we first saw. This is how the LIDAR viewed the Lost City area. The green represents the trees and the jungle, and the blue is a little river. You can't see anything underneath. Well, with the magic of LIDAR, we erased the vegetation in the next slide, and it's like looking at the moon or Mars. And if you look in the river valley, you'll see there's various geometric shapes, squares, pyramids, and other things that represent plazas, pyramids, and whatever. Anyway, after we saw those images, the president called, and he requested that I brief him and his cabinet at a special meeting the next day. Everybody there was thrilled to have such great news emanate from their country after years of bad news. The world media went crazy. Later that year, I was, at it, I was surrounded by all kinds of movers and shakers at an event in Washington, D.C., sponsored by Foreign Policy magazine. Someone from the World Bank approached me and said, would you like us to help you with your project? And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> he said, well, the first thing you got to do is figure out how your project can benefit Honduras financially. I mean, he's a banker. What else is he going to say, right? <laughs> so I thought about it and said, well, it could possibly de help develop some sustainable ecotourism, which could uh, attract more international goodwill, which could also then maybe turn into foreign investment. My mantra was that the Mesquitia is a rare jewel, not only for Honduras, but for the whole world. Rather than a few people making a lot of money from destroying the jungle and looting the ruins, this could be a gift that keeps on giving for generations if cared for properly. Well, much to my surprise, almost everybody, including the government officials, thought this was a great idea and they made it a priority. Now that I had opened Pandora's box, I felt the moral obligation to try and guide the future of the project in the best possible way in the future. I knew we had to mount a ground expedition to verify the LIDAR findings. Plus, we needed to also study the jungle itself. This would require assembling a top-notch team of scientists from a variety of disciplines. It took three years until 2015 to organize this mission. It was far more complicated and risky than the original LIDAR survey, as now we would have to go in by helicopter and hack our way through the jungle. To hedge my bets and keep us alive, I wound up hiring three British SAS jungle warfare experts. Plus, the Hondurans threw in, graciously, some of their Special Forces soldiers. Conditions were really tough at times. Every day we had an encounter with the Fear to Lance Viper, the deadliest snake in the Americas. Inch and a quarter fangs and a strike now, ask questions later attitude. <laughs> we were constantly bombarded by biting insects and surrounded by mud, so much mud that our anthropologist had to be rescued from a mud pit as she was slowly sinking beyond her waist. This is the mud pit. I couldn't, we don't have a picture of her sinking because we were too busy rescuing her. <laughs> I would sometimes sit in my tent listening to the incessant rain and wondering once again, why did I come here and bring all these people to a place that was once called the gates of hell? <laughs> it was a combination of Indiana Jones, Star Trek, and Rambo mixed in with some serious scientific study. I mean, everybody who was there was so impressed with just how untouched and pristine the ruins in the jungle were. At times, it was really almost like a religious experience, and I'm being very serious about that. It's very rare to find a place like this. In addition to the pyramids and the uh, plazas and other structures that were identified by the LIDAR, we also came upon this wonderful cache of beautifully carved stone bowls, vases, and effigies that were created by a culture, in the words of the chief Honduran archaeologist who was with us, we know absolutely nothing about them. So this was a brand new culture no one knew anything about. News of the successful ground operation spread quickly, and the Honduran government became even more committed to sustainably preserving both their natural and cultural patrimony. In fact, the president of Honduras 
made a statement at the Paris Climate Conference stating that he would protect the rainforest from that point forward. This was a very big deal. In addition to that, the Hondurans also organized a special military unit. Their mission was called Operation Forest, and their mandate was to patrol the jungle from that point forward and prevent any incursions by narco-traffickers, looters, and illegal deforesters. We began to work with the government, National Geographic, and Conservation International to start excavating the ruins and studying the unique flora and fauna of the jungle. The government even declared the area a special heritage, protected heritage site, and started working with UNESCO, which is part of the United Nations, for those of you that don't know, in extending whatever international legal protections were available. A nonfiction book was written about the project, it became a New York Times bestseller which was followed by the President of Honduras and the U.S. Ambassador honoring us at a special ceremony. For me, this was an amazing validation after 23 years of pursuing what most people, including myself, thought was a totally ridiculous idea. The government also issued these two stamps in honor of the project. I never, ever thought in my life that I would be involved with something that would be memorialized or commemorated on a postage stamp. In the end, all of us have the ability to change the world in unanticipated ways, both large and small. When an idea or an opportunity presents itself, we just have to rise up, take action, and not just think about it. That's what's going to make the difference in the end. Thank you.